Did you learn anything new this past week? I did. I learned that there are five principles in putting a puzzle together. Five. Can you believe that? In fact, most of us know the first principle, and that is you begin by doing what? You put the outside pieces together, the border, and that helps you complete the puzzle. You say, man, I didn't know you put puzzles together. Listen, I can't even put the little puzzles together my grandchildren have. I give it to Gina. Here, put them together. But you know what? I Googled it. That's right. I went to Google and I said, tell me the principles for putting a puzzle together. And it gave me the five principles for putting a puzzle together. Thank God for Google. Can I get an amen? And if you don't know what Google is, may the Lord bless and keep you. And may his face shine upon you. But you know what? Just as there are principles in putting a puzzle together, there are principles that we need to follow to put our lives together. These are what we are calling disciple-shaping principles. You see, God and his will for your life and my life is that he wants to shape us. That's right. He wants to shape our lives. And he wants to begin using us in ways that perhaps we've never been used, and that would be for the purposes of God in life. Over the next several weeks, I'm going to talk to you about putting the pieces together. And I'm going to give to you over the next several weeks principles for Disciple shaping. In a moment, I'm going to read from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. But before I do that, I want to share with you a little bit about the Scripture. Do you realize the entire Old Testament points you to Jesus Christ? And did you know that the entire New Testament is all about Jesus Christ? And in the New Testament, there are four accounts of the life of Jesus. Each one of them were what we would call eyewitness accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And while you might find variances of the events in each one of those accounts, you will never see the message different overall. It's not four Gospels, it's one Gospel told by four different men who walked with Jesus and who talked with Jesus and who understood the heart of Jesus Christ. Today what I want you to do is that I want you to get a copy of the Word and I want you to stand with me in honor of God's Word. And I want to begin reading in Matthew chapter 4 and I want to read verse 18 through verse number 20. Two, and I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. The scripture says, as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, that is, Jesus, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with Zebedee, their father. And what were they doing? Mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father. And what did they do? The scripture says they followed him. Followed him. Father, I thank you today that you are calling us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
The first principle that I want to give to you in this series is the principle called following. Following. When you look at the principle of following Jesus in the New Testament, you will know that there was always a clear call to follow Jesus, and a line was drawn in the sand. It was never filled with ambiguity. It was never filled with any confusion. Jesus always put out before the people a clear call, and he called them to cross the line. If you were here with us last weekend, you saw a very clear call come. And we call people to cross the line, to believe. And many of them chose to believe. So we need to understand that the power of following Jesus is something that each one of us need to be committed to in life. I want you to look at this picture today. This picture is an interesting picture on the screen. In fact, you will see that that car is hanging over a 100-foot cliff. That's right, a 100-foot cliff. And if it was not for the fence that it hit, it would have gone over the cliff. When they asked the driver, driver, why did you run off the road and go down here and about to go over that cliff. And here's what the driver said. The driver said, I was following my GPS. <laughs> they told me to go wherever my GPS was leading me, and I followed my GPS. I guess if it had not been for the fence, he would have followed his GPS over a 100-foot cliff. If any of you ever felt like that when you were following a GPS? Well, uh, the officer told him, we admire that you are following your GPS, but next time maybe you ought to follow your eyes and know when there's not a road in front of you, don't go. The man was taken to court, and when he appeared before court, he was cited for careless driving. That silly illustration is so representative of what we need to do in following Jesus. We need to be willing to go anywhere, to do anything, whatever it takes even to the point of being willing to cross over a cliff. Now, God's not going to ask you to jump off a 100-foot cliff, so please don't try it, and then blame the pastor for telling you Jesus told you. And Jesus isn't going to tell you to jump off a 100-foot cliff. But I want you to know sometime when you walk in faith and you follow Christ, you might feel like you're jumping over a 100-foot cliff. And we need to be willing to go because Jesus has called us to follow him. He's very committed to us following him. The story here is a great story recorded there in Matthew 4. They were beside the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a beautiful place. I hope you'll go with me in 2013 to see it. When he was there, he saw Peter and John, and Peter, excuse me, Peter and Andrew, and they were brothers, and both of them were professional fishermen. And he issued to them the call to follow him. The Bible says they left their nets and they followed him. He went on down further, and he found James and John with their father named Zebedee, and they were sitting evidently in the boat. They were mending their nets, meaning they were preparing to go fishing, and he told them, hey, I want you to follow me. The Bible says they left immediately, and they also left their father, and they began to follow Jesus. Isn't it amazing? When you look at that story, notice what occurred. There was a clear call given, and what about that call? Pretty powerful. 
they followed Jesus. There was a line to cross in the sand. You might wonder, why in the world would Jesus call fishermen to help him? Because those four men ended up being very strategic in the Gospels. I'm telling you why. Because they were hard workers. They were skilled. They were courageous. Because it took courage to get on the Sea of Galilee at times. It's a large, large sea. And they also walked by a lot of faith, expecting to walk at times with patience. When you think about what a professional fisherman does, it's quite amazing to think that they're able to find fish in the midst of a sea or an ocean. What an accomplishment. That takes a lot of faith. And then you look at this whole concept for fishing for people. Isn't that an interesting thought? You're going to fish for people? Well, Jesus was going to take their life skills, and he was going to begin to use their life skills for gospel purposes. He gave to them an image, and the image was to fish for people. He chose a word picture that they were familiar with in life. In their day, when someone would be known for fishing for people, it would be that they were teaching something, their own ideology of some kind, and they were persuading people to join their ideology. What Jesus was saying to them, listen, I'm going to give to you something that is going to change your life and change the lives of every person you tell. And I want you to go, and I want you to teach them this gospel message, the powerful story of what I'm about to do. And when you do it, I want you to do it with conviction and persuasion and courage, and you will captivate them. You will call them to follow me. And you are no longer going to fish for fish alone, but you're going to fish for people. You know, that has been known as the number one image for what we would call soul winning. You don't hear that term a lot in today's church, but it's still real and it's still true. God wants us to win souls to Jesus Christ. He wants us to win people personally to faith in Jesus Christ. And he has called us to become fishers for men, to fish for people. All of us must be involved in the ministry of personal soul winning. Jesus said here another phrase that's very important. He said, I will make you fish for people. Does that mean when he says, I will make you, that Jesus got him in a chokehold and he was going to make him go fish for people? No, that's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was telling them, I'm going to give to you a process whereby if you will follow this process, you will end up fishing for people. And what I'm going to do over the next several weeks is I'm going to teach you this process. I'm telling you, these guys got it, they caught it, and they lived their lives by it. Let me illustrate for you. Peter, major leader of the New Testament church. Remember, he denied Jesus. Remember that? He also got out of the boat, walked on the water. People make fun of him because he began to sink, but at least he got out of the boat. And how many of you have ever walked on water? Also, it was this man who had a little failure in his life that God chose to use to preach the first message of the gospel to people, and 3,000 people responded in faith and trust to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and the church of the New Testament was born because of the man named Peter preaching the word. Then there was Andrew, great illustration of what I talked about a moment ago. You don't hear a lot about Andrew in scripture, but isn't it interesting that right here you find Andrew in the text. You don't hear a whole lot more about him. But John said that it was Andrew who introduced Peter to Jesus Christ. That's what he says in John 1. Again, eyewitness account. He witnessed it, and he told the story of what he saw. Different than you see anywhere else. 
But also it was Andrew who brought the fish and the loaves at the attention of that to Jesus Christ. He said, here, here's a little boy. He's got fishes and loaves. There are 5,000 people. Here it is, Jesus. That's about all you hear about Andrew. Pretty significant. He pointed Peter, his brother, to Jesus Christ. Very significant. And then you have James. James, the pastor of Jerusalem, the first church. James, the writer of the book of James, a great book over following the book of Hebrews in the New Testament church, referred to himself as being a slave of Jesus Christ in the opening line of that book. And then you have John. Wow, what a guy. He wrote the Gospel of John. He talked about himself in the Gospel of John. You'd never know it, but here's the way he referred to himself. It's really quite humorous. The one whom Jesus loved. That's what he called himself. You look at that book and you'll see it numerous times. The one whom Jesus loved. See, that Jesus was so powerful that he believed in his heart that Jesus loved him like he loved no one else. And I'm telling you, he loves you that way today. He also wrote first and second and third John, those epistles over there at the end of the New Testament. And he also wrote the book of Revelation. But these guys got it, man. They got it. And they got it all the way to their death. Let me illustrate for you that today. First of all, we start with this man named James. James beheaded for his faith. Beheaded for his faith. Andrew, they crucified him. But he told them, I cannot be crucified like my Lord. And they took the cross and they made an X out of the cross and they hung his limbs spread out like this, different than his Lord died. Peter, Peter was crucified. Legend says, history records, that Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. They took the cross and they crucified Peter upside down to his death. John, he wasn't crucified nor beheaded, but they exiled him on an island all by himself as his punishment. And there on that island called Patmos, he saw the revelation of Jesus Christ and he wrote down what he saw. That's what we call the revelation of Jesus Christ. Case in point, these men got it. These men caught it, and they understood what it meant to follow Jesus in life. We're going to talk about that today. That word following is a powerful word. The word follow in the Greek language is the word agalutheo. And you know what it means? Here it is. I'm going to list them quickly. It means come after me, follow after me, willing obedient, learner, server, trainee. I love that word trainee there. Become devoted and attached to. Responder. We're to respond to Jesus. Participants. I like that word too. Self-commitment to the point of what? Breaking all other ties. Remember what they ask? You leave your nets and you leave your father. They broke all the ties. They were used 90 times in the New Testament, that word follow that is translated in that way. When Jesus called these men to follow him, make no doubt about it, he was calling them to use their skills, to use their giftedness for the purposes of God. That call has not changed. God did not ask you to come to him and check your skills and your giftedness at the door. You bring your skills and your giftedness to Jesus along with your life. And you begin to follow him. And he uses those skills and giftedness not only for business and not only for education and not only for family, but for the purposes of God. And we've got to get that in line. Stuart Weber 
in his commentary on Matthew, talked about this phrase, follow me. I love what he writes. He said that Jesus was saying, this is what it meant to follow him. Live with me and learn by watching me. Own my values and priorities. Learn to become passionate for the thing I live for and follow my example by doing the ministry I have come to do. Therefore, Jesus was calling them to follow him. But what does it mean to really follow Jesus? Today, I'm going to give to you three important words that you find as a result of this story, all based upon this word to follow. All right? I want you to get these three words. Word number one, relationship. Relationship. I remember in the 1970s, a man said these words. I will never forget it. And he was a man before his time. But he said, relationship is the key word in all of the English language. How true that is. It is the key word in the entire English language. That's really what Jesus did. Jesus established a relationship. He established a relationship with people. There has to be a defining moment, a clear time when we choose Jesus, when we establish Jesus. He gives to us a clear call. Here's the line, follow me, and we cross that line. Hundreds of people last week in all of our worship centers, they heard the clear call, they crossed the line. They began to establish a relationship. There are people here today who need to establish a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've got to establish it. There's a case, there's a point, there's a moment. No one can get away from that. So I ask you today, have you ever done that? But we cannot simply keep it at that level. That word relationship is far more powerful than simply establishing a relationship. But it's ongoing. It is something that goes on and on and on, something that grows, something that matures, something that, that is nurtured in our lives. And we've got to understand that while there may be various levels of a relationship that go on in each one of our, in one of our lives, we got to see, man, it's about growing. Ongoing relationship means that your relationship with God is growing. It's going forward. It's maturing. It's cultivating. It's renewing. It is, it is becoming more what God wants it to become. Why in the world do we get stuck and we not continue to grow? A relationship that doesn't grow goes the other way. It begins to be stale and stagnant. It begins to mean nothing. It begins to be dead. We've got to go back to understanding what Matthew 16 said when Jesus said, because he gave a clear call to establish, but also a clear call to have an ongoing relationship. He said these words in 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself. That's an initial moment. Take up his cross. That's a daily experience. And do what? follow me. There's always a cost to follow Jesus. There's always a price to follow Jesus. He wants you to be there with him in all that. And there are times when you break all attachments and you go forward with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I ask you today, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you? Let today be the day when you establish that relationship. How's your relationship doing? Growing? Maturing, nurturing, cultivating, learning more. If you're married, surely you know the challenges of that relationship. Certainly, you have established that relationship. But don't you have to work on that relationship? Sure you do. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how long you've been married. Some of you have been married a long time. Older than other people in this room. But you have to do what? You have to nurture it. Well, listen. We have to do that with our relationship to God. Because if we don't, it becomes stale and stagnant. And so I want to urge you, that's what this entire series is about, is, is teaching you how to do that. you got to follow us in that process. 
Second word is the word participation. Participation. We can't be absent or vacant. We've got to participate in this relationship with Christ. We have to participate in this cause around the world. We must be responding to him. We must be serving him. We must be participating with him in every way. When you think about the New Testament church versus the 21st century church, we're talking about a vast, vast difference. We're talking about, I mean, it is a great chasm fixed, it appears, a great gap that exists. Why is that? Because 21st century church, including our own, is more about spectator than participator, more entertaining than engaging, more presenting than participating, more about taking than giving, more about me than them, more about being served than serving, and more about receiving a blessing rather than giving a blessing, becoming a blessing. You know what? That is not following Jesus Christ. Jesus did not call. He did. We're not here to, to, for him to follow us. He has called us to follow him. And that involves us participating with him through all of life. Let me put it this way. Spectator Christianity is not New Testament Christianity. If you think Christianity is walking in this room on a given Sunday and listening to someone share the Word of God and we sing songs of of greatness about the greatness of God, while that is a segment of Christianity, that is not all Christianity. That is a time where hopefully it provides you energy and, and it juices you up so that you can go out here and live on the cutting edge of life and honor God in your life. One of the great blessings of traveling to the Dominican Republic and Brazil, but especially Brazil, was watching our people minister, just watching them. I got much more of a thrill out of that than anything I did, and I got to do some nice things myself. But I'm telling you, it was a great privilege. I'm reminded of a young man named Gareth Patterson. Gareth won a man to Christ. Two days later, went and found where that man lived in that large city in which we were were dwelling and we were ministering, presented the gospel to his whole family and the entire family came to Jesus Christ. He got it. Attorney Don Elliott and his wife, Mona, on the streets of that large city downtown, winning people to faith in Jesus Christ, sharing the powerful message of the gospel. Folks, I'm telling you, They got it. That's what it means. That's what it means. You see, participating with Jesus in life and ministry is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Some of us need to dial in this morning, and we need to really get a hold of that. It is a lifestyle. It's not something I I, I go on a trip once a year. It's not an event at a church. Christianity is a lifestyle. It's me participating with Jesus. We came across this this week, and what a great illustration it is. Uh, It talks about me church. We got it off YouTube. It's pretty powerful. I want you to watch this for a moment because it so personifies what is going on so much in today's church. Imagine a church where every member is passionately, wholeheartedly, and recklessly calling the shots. I have a busy work week, and by the time Sunday rolls around, I'm tired. So how about a church service that starts when I get there? Can do. When you arrive, we begin. This guy, he plays by his own rules. We want to find a church where if he starts screaming, we're not the bad guys, right? Come here. Say no more. If your baby's screaming, you stay seated. The others around you can leave. You know, financially, Sherry and I don't give a lot to the church, but we'd sure like to know who does. All right, if you join now, you'll know what every person gives in detail. When I'm in the church service, can my car get a buff and a wax? Not just that, but an oil change and a tune-up. Hey, how about tickets to the Super Bowl? That's asking too much. I'm serious. If I'm going to join, I want tickets to the big game. All right, you join now and we'll get you there. I like a pony. Look in your backyard. Me Church. 
where it's all about you. You see, that so personifies it, does it not? Entertain me, my terms. Meet my needs. Minister to me, or I'll go somewhere else. This is foreign to the teachings of New Testament Christianity and the heartbeat of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Anytime his followers ever began to make it about themselves, you know what he'd do? He did. He rebuked them severely. Severely. In fact, he told them, get thee behind me, Satan. Wow. (laughs) We better understand today God's called us to something a lot bigger than what we imagine it to be. You see, the future of a church that entertains more than engages, it will die one day a slow death. Participation, it's not an option, but it's a reality. That's what it means to follow Christ. It means that you are playing on the court. You are inside the game. You are on the field. You're not in the stands just yelling and screaming, man, you're there. And that's what a true disciple does. Rick Warren said these words, and I quote today, Jesus' strategy turns spectators into participators, consumers to contributors, audiences to armies, members to missionaries. Word number one, relationship. Word number two, participation. Word number three, mentorship. Mentorship. Do me a favor for a moment. Do not reduce the meaning of what I'm about to talk about through what we imagine mentoring is. Give me a chance to tell you what Jesus meant. Sometimes we think mentoring is going to breakfast with some old man telling us how to live life. Or we have reduced mentoring to a classroom or to a curriculum. While that may have a small segment of mentoring, In and of itself, that's not the heart of Jesus we see represented here. Let me illustrate. The secret to understanding mentorship is this entire concept of what it means to follow. Trainee, get that. Trainee. Learner. Obedient. Participant. Get those words. Trainee, trainee, learner, obedient, participant. Just a short time before my mom died, probably within a month or so, I forget specifically, I flew down and went to MD Anderson Hospital, Cancer Hospital there in Houston, Phenomenal hospital. I'm sitting there by myself in the room. Mom is pretty zeroed out. She came back, had a few strong days, but at that time it was she was really in tough shape. The doctor came in and following her, that doctor was a team of other doctors. All they did was listen as that doctor talk to them about mom and her condition. Pretty soon that doctor started asking questions to that group of other people. Oh, they were doctors also. They had completed all the classroom experience referred to as doctors, but they were in their residency. And that doctor was letting them get in real life situations Not unsupervised at that time, but real life situations teaching them. And mom was the subject. 
pretty powerful. Do you know that's what Jesus did? Did you hear me? That's what Jesus did. He took those men with him for three years, everywhere he went. He put them in situations of challenge. He let them practice some on their own, but he never left them overall. And sometime he had to come and he had to rescue them, did he not? Absolutely. But it wasn't simply about Jesus sitting them down on a hillside for three solid years, and all he did was teach them and never let them experience it. Are you listening? Are you with me, church? It's not about knowledge. Are you getting it? It's good to have knowledge because you can never go to places you don't know about. I was reading Corinthians today in 1 Corinthians 8. You know what it says about knowledge? Listen to these words right out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Knowledge inflates with pride. Why in the world do we think Christianity is about sitting in a classroom and having somebody instruct us? It's far greater than that. I mean, how many of you today... Let's say all of a sudden happens in your life, and and you have to have major surgery this afternoon. I mean, it's major. And they come to you, and they say, hey, he said, hope you don't mind. This doctor we have here, he's just completed all of his classes. He's he's never done this before. You know, he did it on somebody dead, but he's never done anybody alive. And and if you don't mind, we're going to let him, we're going to let him do it on you. And you know, if it doesn't work, you know, you may die, but he's got to start somewhere. I mean, how many of y'all would like that? Huh? Do I have a vote? No. You say, no, we're waiting, man. We're waiting on the man or the woman who knows what they're doing. Do you know a doctor, though, has never been placed in that predicament without being placed already under supervision with him through that process. I have a question for you. Why in the world do we think being a disciple is just having knowledge and doing absolutely nothing with it when what we learn Why have we so reduced it down to our knowledge? We need to be mentored by the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to hang out with Jesus, be with Jesus, walk with Jesus, and let him train us up in the lifestyle that he wants us to go. We can't do that if we don't hang with him. We have to have that relationship, but we've also got to have that relationship go forward with us. Following Jesus, you know what it involves? It involves a relationship. Following Jesus, what does it involve? It involves participation. And following Jesus also involves something else. It's called mentorship. I have a question for you today. And the question this morning Have we lost it? We lost power. We let game power. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) I didn't lose my power. (laughs) But, you know, I want you to think about this today. Have we ever established a relationship with Christ? You need to establish a relationship with Jesus if you never have. There's a clear call. Follow him. Lines drawn in the sand. It's the way to life. You got to cross over. Are you going to cross over? Cross over today. But also, my friend, it's about having that ongoing relationship. That ongoing relationship where he mentors you, he coaches you through life. 
He leads you through life. He guides you through life. And you're being more transformed into his image every day because God is working in your life and you're putting into action what God has for you in your life. It's about crossing over, but it's also about keeping on going. And you know what? There are a lot of us today, we need to get back on the road to following Christ. Some of us, we're just like that guy who's about to go off the cliff, and, and because we had to walk by faith a minute, we just backed off and said, ah, it's not for me. Or many of us, we identify with Simon Peter, who, who, who we, we tried to get out there on the edge, but we denied him. We failed. And so we're just going to stay in the boat. We're going to stay where the comfort is, where, where we don't have anything to lose. Let me tell you, there's always something to gain or lose in Christianity. Amen. There's always a price to pay. There's always a moment. There's always a time when you have to walk on. And if you don't walk correctly, there's that price to pay also. But if you're willing to walk on and go with God, it is wonderful what the Lord does in your life. And it all comes through going on, going forward, and keeping on when you want to give up. Would you begin to believe again today? I'm telling you, will you believe again today? Let faith arise in your heart and follow Jesus today in a brand new way.